don't we why don't we begin so th so this class uh, I've got two classes we've got these things divided up what um, what I hate to do is to be gone during the week and come right back and preach because then you spend the whole week you're supposed to be doing something else working on a sermon so uh, so I preach next week and then the following week Jesse has planned a lovely summer vacation in Little Rock Arkansas for us. <laughs> and um, and so, do what? No, no, no. I need I need 100% humidity to make it to make it feel like real summer. So, um, so then let's see. That that week, um, John Stone Street is preaching, and Mike Williams is teaching. Then the following week. Uh, Jesse and I have to do a wedding. I have to do a wedding at West Point, and we get in like at three o'clock Sunday morning. So Robert is preaching. You're on the 14th. John's on the 21st. Okay. Christiana Fogler, marrying Saul Herrera, who went to West Point. Thus, the wedding at the West Point Chapel, which is fun to do. And so then, so you're preaching on the 21st. John's preaching 14th. You're on the 14th. John is on the 21st. Mike is Mike is then teaching that Sunday. I've, now I usually don't warn people because I want to keep attendance up. That's, uh, yeah, well, Ro Robert and I both think that about ourselves. You see, because we went to the seminary of give you confidence or or arrogance. I don't know which it, which it is. Um, so at Senate, uh, so what I'm, what I'm teaching on this week is sort of the vision for the diocese that the bishop has, and then the following week, what we're, next week, what we're doing in the parish about this next year. We've got a lot of things that we're trying to pull off that will crystallize this week, and I'll be able to talk about them uh, next week. Um, but when the bishop gave his... Um, address, he asked me to do a preamble to it based on authority. And he told me that by a text message as we were getting on the plane to go to Toronto for diocesan Senate. So I sat there on the plane and wrote down a bunch of notes. Well, I thought it was just too brilliant what just automatically came out of my head, uh, even though he didn't use it, um, to not use it as sort of a, a baseline from which we then understand both his leadership and the way the church operates in this way. And it's really quite simple, authority in the church. Um, if we look at uh, God's activity in the beginning out of nothing, he brought order out of chaos. And the church's role on one level is to bring order out of chaos, to announce the godly order in the midst of cultural chaos. And so our structure is meant to do that by a godly order of discipline. And in the Nigerian church, we have real discipline um, of bishops, priests, deacons, and laity. Uh, and so that's the order uh, of the church, that's the structure that is supposed to keep everything in line. Um, it, it's messy at best, but at least there is a structure. So, so we know what, and, um, and Bishop Williams does this to me all the time when we're sitting back in our shared office space back there, he reminds me he's the bishop. <laughs> so we have immediate order in the office. Um, and, but in, in Nigeria, the same goes for the laity. I was uh, talking with John Stone Street on Friday afternoon, and, and he was talking about the whole um, issue of the ministry of the laity and the laity understanding that they're part of the ministry team reaching out rather than the object of ministry from the clergy, and that the church is impotent until it gets that 
sort of squared away. So bishops, priests, deacons, and laity. And we have authority. This is one of my favorite lines from seminary when Reg Fuller says, as T.W. Manson says, um, Jesus had authority because he was under authority. And we really only have um, authority when we're under authority, when we're within a discipline um, which grants us that authority. Um, I was talking with the bishop late, late last night about some things going on in Nigeria this next week, uh, and it's all, it was all a matter of hierarchical authority. And when you submit yourself to that authority, then you do have authority because you're backed up by authority. Um, does that make sense? Uh, and so, um, so our apostolic succession in that way is very important to us. Our place in the bishops, priests, deacons, and laity is very important in our system. And when you undermine the authority above you, you undermine your own authority uh, in that way. Uh, that's been particularly difficult in recent years because there's this huge conflict uh, within the church. And so people are questioning one another and it's not this nice, obedient life that we used to have. Then, uh, then as part of that, as an extension of that, is um, the whole issue of unity within the church. Uh, within our church, we talk about in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, charity. So we understand the things that are absolutely essential in the faith, and we live together with great diversity about things that are not. Then you get into a discussion about what is and what is not, um, and we use in that case for authority what you call conciliar decision making, um, which is the whole church working on something. There's a fellow here in town that keeps telling me, I want you to call another ecumenical consul. I go, I'm a parish priest. I can barely get the vestry to meet all at the same time. How am I supposed to call a worldwide ecumenical consul with everybody certain of what they believe already and perfectly fine with it? But anyhow, it sort of slowed down because I told him I could investigate it if he would write a check for $250,000 to the church. And, and um, I haven't heard anything about it in that sense. Um, it, our unity, um, Reg Fuller used this term, um, is not what he called joinery, but it, the unity in the church is the work of the Holy Spirit, working among us to bring us to all truth. Um, it, drawing us, and the real work of the Holy Spirit is to draw us into the loving relationship of the Trinity, that we may share in the life of God. And within the life of God, we receive this, um, not only a sense and experience of, but the reality of a unity of love that is in the unbreakable Trinity. Uh, and we become part of something much larger uh, than ourselves. So in this way, um, order and obedience and succession all go together to build up the kingdom as the Holy Spirit as we calm our lives for the Holy Spirit to become the ally of the human spirit and draw us into that uh, into the Godhead. Our lack of obedience then becomes destructive to the kingdom. One of the one of the nice things about St. George's is that um, uh, we. Everybody, everybody who doesn't kind of, uh, this is a good thing about denominations, I believe, it, is that there's a cohesiveness here, so we don't have a destructive kind of argument disobedience. We have a legitimate seeking the truth, seeking a deeper relationship with God, uh, seeking to move ourselves closer into the Godhead, seeking to, as the bishop will call us to do, love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, and so, um, so we become um, something uh, that's much larger than themselves. We're able to give up our, um, and die to our own idiosyncrasies and live into communion with God. Um, then finally, um, well not finally, but um, we are submitted to, uh, clergy are submitted to, people say, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? Well, I can't. <laughs> 
I can't because I'm under orders. That's what ordination is about, under orders. Um, to the teaching, which is the doctrine of the church, to the structure, which is the discipline of the church, and the prayer book, which is the worship of the church. Uh, that's what clergy are supposed to do. Um, so uh, this is our heritage, and we are under orders to communicate that alone. Um, a, a lot of churches will have, um, and, and we do in a different kind of way, have these what you'd call worship teams that design the worship in the way they're going to do it every week. I always tell uh, everybody, they say, who's on your worship team? I'll say, Thomas Cramner and Jesus <laughs> is, are on my worship team, and we just use the prayer book. Um, it, it makes it much easier that way, but it's also what you commit to when you're ordained. It's also what you're authorized to do. And in the Nigerian church, I just saw a guy write something the other day, just blasting away at the church. Well, he, he got defrocked for that because he wouldn't follow Bishop Felix's understanding of the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the church. Gone, gone. Um, gone, but still vocal, I guess. Um, uh, so when we look at church growth, um, we think the church growth needs to be the result of our obedient faithfulness. Um, I tell the story all the time about somebody else's story, Mark Lawrence, who talks about going to school and college in Berkeley, California, and going to all these churches that, and he was really like a freshman in college in bad shape, misbehaving like crazy. And he went to all these churches and they said, well, you're just fine. You're just fine. No, I'm not. I'm a train wreck. And I'm blowing my whole life. And he went to the Episcopal Church and had to say the confession that he was a miserable offender. And he said, whoa, somebody's finally going to address my problem here, uh, that I'm a miserable offender. Uh, and he found that helpful. And church growth comes in that way, not by telling people what they want to hear, but what God has said to us. That's how we grow the church, by being faithful. Jesse, remember that little guy who was the, had been on the staff at St. Michael and St. George when we got there? I can't remember his name now. And I preached my first sermon. And on the way out the door, he said, you'll go very far because you're telling everybody what they want to hear. And I thought, well, that is the nastiest thing anybody's <laughs> ever said to me. And I couldn't, I've never, uh, 42 years later, 40 years later, I can't figure out what he meant. I could tell you more about that story, but uh, not, I'm not going to. Um, so, and, so in this obedience, in this authority, we love to do what God commands uh, and loving to do what the bishop commands. That's sort of how this works. God loves, we love to do what God commands because the bishop tells us what that is. Um, and, and how that all happens, how this all happens, um, I think it was Oz Guinness that, um, that wrote this. I just had this in my notes that I wrote in the airplane from authority that real participation in communion changes people. Real presence, the Roman Catholic doctrine of real presence, changes the elements. Isn't that an interesting distinction? Are we worried about what's going on in the altar in communion or what God is doing to our hearts within our participation in communion, in the relationship. In, I mean, communion is that special place where we enter most intensely into a relationship with God. And, and if that is true, what's happening there is much more important than what's happening on the altar. We know the bread and the wine are the vehicles that sort of pull the veil apart and bring us closer to God. But we're less interested in what's happening to the elements than we are what's happening in our hearts. Uh, and that's sort of an Anglican doctrine of Eucharistic participation. Um, I've, I've got these other little things that are just sort of um, funny about... Um, about authority. Um, in, in my notes, I have, first of all, no triangles. So, so where's Barb Walker? We have this little thing that goes on that um, 
um, Savannah, who does Sunday morning coffees, always asks Barb Walker if she can take off on a Sunday. And then Barb Walker comes and bats her eyes at me to try to get me to let Savannah off. And I just realized this triangle this morning when Savannah wasn't here. And that triangle is going to stop this week. Um, but so no triangles. We talk directly to one another. That's the biblical model uh, of the way we get along in the church. So no triangles. No gossip. We don't have a problem in, with gossip uh, here. Uh, Carol Rowe has stopped gossip in this church and her mother before her for decades. Uh, and that's always been very helpful. Um, uh, but nobody gossips. Everybody is um, free with, their, with what they think. But that's very different than being free with what we know. One of my rules pastorally here is that the church is not a source of information. So uh, I'm with people all the time, and uh, clergy have all these things in their head, and they don't tell them. They just, the rule is you don't say anything about anything. So people will say, well, what do they have, or are they in the hospital, or have they gone home? I don't know. Have to find out from them. Call them and ask them. Because we're not going to be the source that this and this and this is going on because we ought not to be. It destroys people's uh, trust in us. So, we're, um, so we don't triangulate, we don't gossip, and we don't share information that quickly becomes gossip, although it would be nice if the congregation would tell me when you're going into the hospital or if you know of somebody who's in the hospital. Um, the, the one last thing I have to say about that is uh, years ago somebody at Grace called the bishop up Bishop Winterrow and said do you know he is sitting in your chair during Sunday morning services because there is that central chair over there is the bishop's chair and Bishop Winterrow who had a good sense of humor and was a good friend of ours uh, he said um I want him to sit there to remind him whose ministry he is performing here. Well, see, that's exactly right. It is the bishop's ministry. A rector is not in place unless the bishop wants him to be. And I've found that out both by being the person the bishop wants there and not the person the bishop wants there. Um, it's nicer to be the person the bishop wants. Um, but, so, so I told... I told that to Bishop Orgy, and Bishop Orgy said, well, sit in that chair to remind yourself, given who you are, uh, whose ministry you're doing in that church. So th that's why we do that, and I think it's a, it's a, good, a good symbol. Well, now um, I'm halfway through sort of my time, so I want to tell you about Bishop Felix's um, vision. Um, this is a total paraphrase and condensing so when Bishop Felix gets up to give his convention talk, we all know that from that moment on, we will not be on time for anything else because two hours turns into three and he wanders off into other things. If you think I wander, you ought to see Bishop Felix wander. I will text his wife, who's always got her cell phone there. Lillian, where do you think he's headed? and she'll write back, I can only imagine. Uh, and a couple years ago, we saw that the bishop had his cell phone right on the podium, and Lily and I texted the whole time he was talking. Oh, he can't say that, he can't mean that. And you could see him look over and see these flashes of what we were, so we kind of directed the talk a little bit. Um, but anyhow, they're great fun and very entertaining, and he's a really fine theologian. Uh, so, um, so it's very helpful. So he says um, that we seem to think if we behave like Jesus, most people will th simply think that we are so lovely, they will follow Jesus and enjoy in our church just because we're, we're such nice people. But in fact, uh, Jesus was not particularly like so if we think that being a likable person is to be like Jesus, we've got it all wrong. He was especially not liked by religious people. And the religious folks were constantly trying to entrap him. 
by tricking him into saying something of which they did not um, approve. Now, the toughest part of ministry is walking the line between all the things people want you to say and the things people don't want you to say. So we've got a really diverse congregation. And so I, I'm constantly hearing from both sides, oh, we wish you'd talk about that more. Oh, you really ought not to say that. Well, why don't you, why don't you add something in on the theological position about that? You really ought not to talk about that subject. And people get really, really intense about what they think. Well, we don't play to one person or another. We try to listen to what kind of theological interpretation the whole congregation wants. So if sometimes you're, you're unhappy, good. Because that both challenges you and tough, because I'm unhappy too trying to walk the fence road, the fence, the tightrope. Uh, but anyhow, so, uh, so clergy like Jesus are not particularly well liked. Um, uh, and, and in part, this is why uh, Felix talked about this. This is why clergy get demoralized and seek out those who agree with them, usually an attractive young woman. And then everything goes. I'm married to an attractive young woman, so I don't have that. <laughs> so what Felix says is that Jesus um, trumped everybody in his response um, because his response actually uh, caught them at what they were doing, the games they were playing, the misinterpretation they had of scripture. And nobody liked that. We, um, we ought to think transcendently. So uh, Bishop Salmon's wife is a friend of mine on Facebook. And, um, and, and she said something the other day about Bishop Salmon. And I said, well, I thought he's been right for 50 years. And, um, and she wrote something back about that. But the reason Bishop Salmon always seemed to catch something deeper and uh, more intelligent on every ar argument is that he was thinking transcendently, that he was, he was thinking out of his Christian faith and out, out of God's ordering of creation. And he was able to, in the loving way that Jesus did that, challenge folks to think more deeply, more, um, more uh, doctrinally, out of a, a more solid understanding. And he won every argument right up into the, until the day he left this earth. Um, he, he told me one time, this, and this is really good for all of us, I think. It's one of my favorite phrases. I had stomped out of a meeting for some reason, and, and I didn't come back. And he called me up, and he said, why aren't you back? And I said, well, that, that person really did irritate me. And he said, you know, Don, if you're looking for a way to have your feelings hurt, you can always find one. Isn't that a normal response we have? We're looking for a way to have our feelings hurt. And if we want to stop out of the meeting, now he would leave meetings at the very beginning, usually. Uh, so I don't know what, um, it, what was the other thing that, there was another one he used to say, but I, I can't remember it. Anyhow, Felix wrote um, that he, he divided his talk into loving God and then loving our neighbor. And he said, um, our Lord is calling for a total giving of self to God, a total giving of self to God, more than just creedal belief, but to love him with all our being, with all our completeness of devotion that allows for no rival or no competition, no half-hearted commitment, but a total self-giving of ourselves, a total commitment of, of the self, the heart, um, to God and no one else. Always seeking to do what pleases and honors God. To ask ourselves the question, does this behavior honor God or dishonor God? Does what we're doing please him or not? Giving to him our worship and praise, our gifts, our material offerings. Obeying what he commands. Um, and what Felix was talking about a good bit is that obeying what God commands um, is meant to protect 
and seal and define our relationship with him. So he quoted R.C. Sproul. Isn't that one of your favorite guys, Robert? No, you don't like R.C. Sproul? The, the, not everything he said is wrong. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, Felix likes R.C. Sproul, but he comes from that whole J.I. Packer, um, Vancouver, uh, evangelical deal. Um, Gordon Conwell Seminary and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a little, it's a little more rigorous than we would be because it makes God so hard um, yeah. So, so there is this part of Christianity that is that I find, I think Robert finds, and our seminary found, just not so hard that it's not very attractive, um, and, and you just kind of recoil from it because it doesn't, it doesn't get you either. You're either here or you're where they are. And where they are is not very attractive at all. Um, and it leaves no space for somebody to grow. You've either instantly got the, uh, I, I tell a story about John Eldridge, who's like that. You know, John Eldridge, who wrote those, what's those books? Wild yeah, Wild at Heart books. He's become a multimillionaire on that whole scam. Um, the, the, um, but uh, a lot of my friends like the Wild at Heart stuff, but I, Alan Crippen got me to go have lunch with John Eldridge one day, and he said, well, what do you think about abortion? And I said, well, you know, it's a really difficult subject, and I took a normal Episcopal pastoral view on that, and he said, well, then you're just a murderer. And I said, well, that's a little tough, isn't it? It's a little hard. And I got up and left. <laughs> uh, and, but but, but there, there is a way that we can approach questions the way Jesus approaches us, that is both uh, certain in his authority, but loving of our neighbor. And that's what Felix was asking us to do. Um, now, what R.C. Sproul says is, loving a holy God is beyond our moral power. The only kind of God we can love by our sinful nature is an unholy God. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? The only kind of God we can love by our sinful nature, is an unholy God, a God that is more corresponding to our unholy nature, an idol made of our own hands. Uh, unless we are reborn of the Spirit of God, unless God sheds his holy love in our hearts, unless he stops in his grace, stoops in his grace, uh, to change our hearts, we will not love him. You see, there's a the, the word love in there means directing somebody to what is right, but it also um, means a meeting them where they are and moving them that way, rather than just setting the bar up here saying, I bet you can't jump that high uh, kind of thing. So uh, I just think it's very interesting that um, a lot of people get all wound up about God who blesses them, but he, they, they like that God because he likes the same dysfunction that they do. Um, as opposed to being reborn of the Spirit and God sheds his holy love into our hearts uh, and stoops in his grace to change our hearts. We will not really love him. Um, and St. Paul in this morning's lessons talks about flesh versus spirit. Um, the, the spirit affects the flesh, according to St. Paul, but he's, he's really talking about leaving one thing behind and going to another, and that's what R.C. Sproul is talking about here, uh, that um, uh, to love a holy God requires grace, and grace strong enough to pierce our hardened hearts and awake our morbid souls to see the glory of God and the life of God. It, do you see how that's not, that's not this hard beat you up stuff? That that's, that's a journey? that unveils itself and draws us into it. Um, this, um, this is what is known as spiritual regeneration, um, when our hearts are softened and changed and reformed. Uh, and true, the true grace of spiritual generation is found in Christ alone. So then, Felix says, once you have a regenerate heart, once you've gone through this 
process or started going through this process. Then he talks about loving, uh, loving our neighbor. Uh, and I, th- I found it very helpful. He started with C.S. Lewis. He says, love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be attained. That's what loving our neighbor is. A steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good. In other words, we do that with our children, don't we? Loving them is to help them move in the direction that's for their ultimate good. Um, So then he lists these things. He said, seek a person's spiritual well-being, conform to the image of God, reflecting God's glory in their life. So what does that mean? If we really love people, um, we should uh, bring them into the community of the faithful so that they can hear the gospel, uh, so they can see that model to them within uh, the life of the church. So we seek a person's spiritual well-being is one way to love them. We seek a person's emotional and social well-being. That's why we greet newcomers, is to bring them into the body of Christ, to make them feel welcome. Um, uh, Bishop um, Williams and I got a letter the other day about how we failed at doing that. It was brutal. It was brutal. It was another priest. It was a trick, um, I I think, the way they, they hung out. Um, but um, we resisted the temptation of helping him with his own emotional and social well-being uh, about how you relate to other people. Um, it, was, it was a pretty interesting thing, but we, we care about that. So if somebody's hurting, we put our arm around them. Um, if they're standing on the outside of coffee hour, we bring them in. We want them to feel part of our community. We're not a, a closed group. Uh, one time somebody said, well, Eric Zollner said, that everybody who ought to be in our church already is. And I said, he was kidding. That was a joke. That's the way we act, but it's not what we believe. Um, Then Felix said that we want to seek the person's material and practical well-being. So Dave Shepson, you all know Dave Shepson. They were here in church last Sunday. So... Uh, he had a flat tire this week and found out in some, one of his, yeah, he lives in Dallas, that there wasn't a jack in the car, or at least he couldn't find it, so he had to go buy a jack to change the tire. And I said, Dave, if you all move back up here, I'll change all your flat tires for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> in other words, we want to care for the practical issues of people so that they can focus on being part of our community. Uh, we want to seek the well-being of everyone, including our enemies, including our enemies. A group of us had a discussion on Friday, and the hardest thing to do with people is not to get them to compete with other places, but like Grace Church. What do all of us think about Grace Church? We want Grace Church to be successful. We want to flir- We want it to flourish because it is God's church. It is one of God's vehicles for touching the hearts. Uh, and minds of other people. So we want them to be successful for the kingdom of God. Um, A lot of us have a lot of money tied up in that place. We want our investment to do well. We don't want somebody to take it over at bargain basement prices and turn it into condominiums. We want it to be a successful ministry to the glory of God. So um, we wish the well-being of everyone, including our enemies. Um, We will not... Um, He says, we will not be conceited um, and dishonor our neighbor. So we don't want to be uppity about what we have, but share it in a glorious kind of way. And then he says, one of the things we'll do is repent and apologize when we offend one another. Really to do that, not to say, well, they just need to get over it. That's the defensive posture. They just need to get over it. I was right, they were wrong, they just need to sleep on that for a while and get themselves sorted out. Is that what you do when you're teasing me, is just leave it? Yeah, okay. (laughs) Um, Oh, to talk about apologizing? Well, remember, love is never having to say you're sorry. Yeah, there's some theology for you. 
Um, so we, we really do need to take repentance and apology as our first step. When, it, when tensions and emotions run high, part of the way we love our neighbor is not to be conceited and to repent and apologize. And guess what? People will always meet you halfway. And then everything is settled. The stubbornness of not apologizing is really, it just takes forever to overcome. So, um, so Felix says at the end, to love one another is to have a passion for evangelism, is really to invite them into this life in Christ, um, to share with them the joy of living in God's world on God's terms. So when we um, love God, we then naturally love to worship, we naturally love to to go to his church, we naturally love his people, and we give freely of ourselves in that environment. See, there's something different about that than agreeing with one another, isn't there? When we have experienced God's love, when he has changed our heart, then, uh, then our primary focus is on God, and we love God, and out of that, we end up loving our neighbor, because what do we have in common? We love to be in God's presence, to worship him. We love to be in his church and the fellowship of the saints, loving his people and giving freely of ourselves. Those are the keys to real Christian life. Okay, it's not, um, somebody told me this week that my last class where I talked about the controversies in the church was very unsettling. And I said, well, the number of people who read about it on the internet who wanted answers uh, needed settling. So, there were these two things going on about that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, the real life of the church is not in the controversies. It's not in this whole thing with the prosperity gospel. It's not in the constitution and canons of the Nigerian church that we're worried about. We simply love to worship God. and We love to be in his church. We love to be in the fellowship of the saints. And, and we are rewarded most by giving freely of ourselves into that system and living happily into that system. Um, Jesse and I have lived in the church our entire lives. On our first date, when I asked Jesse to go to church with me the next morning, we found out we went to the same church. And I never had to propose. It was just we were going to have to get married after that. <laughs> so, so we had to get married because we went to the same church. Um, uh, but, but we talk about this often that our life in the church is wonderful. We love to go to church. We love to worship. We love to be with other people in church and, and, and to give away uh, of ourselves. And, and that has been a wonderful way to live life. Um, I wouldn't change it for anything. And, and many of you all have experienced the same thing. And, and our job is to share that, to evangelize people. Come into this life in God. It's a wonderful way to be because it's what God intended, how God intended us to live our lives. So that's what Felix wants the clergy to talk about. So I just did, so now I can go back to talking about um, anything else I want to talk about, I guess. <laughs> Next week I'm going to talk about some things we're doing into the fall, some plans we have, some different things. Everybody keeps asking me about, um, am I going to hire another assistant? Uh, yes. I am, and I'll tell you who that is next week.